October 2020. Cardi B's lyrical masterpiece, WAP, has taken the world by storm, as bouts are still being held in the ring rather than the award shows. How primitive. Meanwhile, up in Scotland, a young man is creating a YouTube channel. And as he posts his very first video, he's blissfully unaware that he's just made a promise that would go unfulfilled for 18 months. Until now. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to the Feral North devlog. If you're new here, Feral North is a game where you play as a border collie on a journey to restore color to the Scottish Highlands along with your human. And this is a particularly exciting update. Since the very first video on this channel, I've been working on a big problem. Over 20 devlogs later, and the solution continues to elude me. I've only ever talked about this a handful of times, because honestly I've been scared that I'd never figure it out, and that Feral North wouldn't be the game that I set out to make. You see, Feral North definitely leans on the casual side, and that's exactly how I want it, but it's also not a walking simulator, or it's not meant to be. I always said the game would include some light puzzle and stealth elements, and I've shared the idea of monsters a few times, but the updates have been very few and far between because I kept hitting roadblocks. To be honest, I've actually considered dropping the feature. <clears throat> uh, thankfully, I've always decided to keep at it, because I've finally got a solution I'm happy with. So let's see how we got here. All the way back in the very first devlog, I shared these tall, almost Tim Burton-esque creatures. They look kind of cool, and at the time I said, Yeah, so that's going to be a very core concept and core feature to the game is the stealth and the monsters and everything, so... I was super optimistic, but then... Well, I didn't mention them for six months. I could never quite figure out how they would actually work. Would they attack you or the girl? Would they destroy color or be destroyed by color? What if the color source is moving or it's stationary? What if it's airborne? There are so many micro decisions in game design, and it's not always clear what the effects of each decision are going to be. When I finally shared an update, it was really just a tech demo for a solid stealth system and a... Honestly, kind of crappy field of view visualizer. I was super proud of the technical implementation for the visualization, but it just really wasn't useful. I got stuck in the trap of building an interesting technical system without actually testing it in real levels to see if it was interesting to play with. The next month, still completely unclear on how monsters would work, I started on a new design complete with procedural animations. I was, and still very much am, much happier with this direction. I always wanted the monsters to be a personification of the human character's emotions, but having them as actual humanoid characters never felt quite right. This new design stuck with human theme and it's super creepy, while also detaching the monsters from reality, which is important for the story that I want to tell. Okay, so at this point, I had a solid foundation for a stealth mechanic, a creepy monster design, and a field of view visualizer. And then, well, I never shared another update for a whole year. So it's at this point that I need to share a friendly reminder to wish us Feral North on Steam. Wishlisting means you get notified when the game releases, and it helps Steam recognize that there's an audience for the game, so they'll help us out a little bit when we get closer to launch. Okay, so I started blocking out Island 3, and I knew it was now or never for the monster to make its appearance. Island 3 is perfectly suited to be their introduction. It's super dark and tense, but I still just didn't know how I wanted them to work. I did finally figure it out though, so let me share a couple lessons I learned. The first is to subtract rather than add. The biggest problem I had was I was never clear on whether the monster should attack the player, the girl, color, all of the above, none of the above. Each option has consequences, and I just couldn't decide what the best approach was. But then, the story on this island presented a perfect opportunity, as Chesley is separated from his person, which means I didn't have to worry about how monsters would actually interact with her at all. That just leaves color and the player, which actually significantly reduces the number of scenarios I need to account for, gets rid of the most complicated ones entirely. The second lesson is, just do something. When I'm stuck on a decision, I find the best thing to do is literally anything. As soon as you start working in one direction, new ideas will emerge, as well as new restrictions. And remember, restrictions can be a really good thing. For example, the lure from the original hand design was meant to trick the player into approaching. But as soon as I started laying out encounters in the real game and not in the test scene, it just proved to be a really limiting factor in the level design, so I dropped it entirely. By picking an option and starting, you'll learn so much that oftentimes the decisions seemingly fall into place on their own. Lost Relic recently posted a great video on the subject of decision making and game design. I definitely recommend checking it out for a much more detailed discussion on this subject. So I forced myself to put together a series of encounters using only the systems I had already created. 
I put together a basic design where the monster attacked the player if you stood in its field of view, attacked stationary color sources so you could use them as a distraction, and they would be aggressive but kind of afraid of moving color sources, so carrying a thistle for example meant you could sort of fend them off a little bit. I put together a few encounters throughout the level and shared it with another developer whose opinion I really respect, and they offered me some very valuable feedback. The biggest thing was to drop the field of view system. Deep down, I knew it wasn't really working, but sometimes the developer in me has a hard time giving up the fun technical bits. They were right though, it basically ruined any sense of intensity as you knew exactly where you could safely step. So I did away with the field of view, and in fact I did away with the whole concept of vision altogether. It was also suggested to check out the beached things from Death Stranding. I've never played the game, but after looking to it a little bit, I knew it was the way to go. The beach things reminded me of the clickers from The Last of Us. I'm a huge baby with horror. I could barely make it through that game, but the clickers were the perfect balance of intensity and mood for me, without being scary. They can't see you, they can only hear you, so the fact that you can walk right up to them and as long as you're quiet they won't detect you is really intense, and it leaves you with this constant state of unease, which is exactly what I want. In order to make this work, I felt they needed to be a little bit more mobile, so I've removed the arm for now. I think it may return in a more shadowy or ethereal form, but by removing that anchor they're free to roam and you need to be much more aware of the location. Admittedly it does look a little goofy right now, but hey it's a first draft. Anyways, as they wander about they're listening for any sounds, things like footsteps, jumps, barks, and if they hear you they'll become agitated and as you continue to make noise, well you'll have to wait and see. This really puts the emphasis on mood and atmosphere instead of difficulty or scariness. Of course, it can't be too easy either, so I've introduced a few ways to force the player into making noise, or at least give them the option to for a quicker path through the encounter. I've also added little breakable rock piles that fall over if you bump into them. These little interactions are just kind of fun to add throughout the world in non-stealth areas as well, so let me know if you have any other ideas for additional little interactions I should add, especially if they make noise. All in all, for the first time I'm actually feeling confident about the direction the monsters are headed in Feral North. They feel like they genuinely belong in the game, they suit the mood and story, and I've caught myself holding my breath as I test levels, which is an amazing feeling when playing something that you made. But as always, I want to be very clear, Feral North is not going to be an overly difficult or intense game. It's meant to be casual and approachable, more about mood than sophisticated gameplay, and I think it's really important not to try and turn this into some sort of horror feature. I recently started playing the Uncharted series, and I'm really loving it, but I found the zombies and minor jump scares in Uncharted 1 sort of ruined the game for me. It's just my opinion of course, but I really want to avoid ruining an otherwise approachable game with a short sequence of horror that's not enough for horror fans, and yet still too much for those who dislike horror. You can't please everyone, so it's important to keep the intended audience in mind. There's still a lot of work left to do here, but I want to hear your thoughts. If you've been following me for a while, then monsters shouldn't really come as a surprise, but how do you feel about the direction they're going? I'm really excited, it feels genuinely fun even in this crude early state, and a big step towards realizing the original vision I had for the game. Anyways, I do need to leave some secrets for you on Island 3 and beyond, so that's going to be it for this devlog. If you made it this far, you're the best. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.